Hey there. We're going to uh, finish that Bob Stromberg story called The Bee Bagger out of Why Geese Fly Farther Than Eagles. It's only been a moment or so for me since I paused, but it's been, been a couple of days for you. So remember, Bobby took his accordion to, back to his grandpa to see about fixing it because it was full of bees, and he started using their old wore-out vacuum cleaner to suck up the bees. So now he's got an idea. He's taking the vacuum cleaner. So off he went. The first thing I had to do was get rid of the bees in, the ba in my bag. My uncle had all those bees in the little white stacked houses out in his field, so I had a special suit, netting, and helmet to shield him from, his, from the stings. So he had a special suit. I tried the vacuum on my bike basket. I tied the vacuum on my bike basket with some old strings and bungee straps and started to ride the five miles out into the country. My mind was racing as fast as my feet could go. I imagined the new accordion in the music store window with 120 buttons, 53 keys, red sparkle plastic with white bellows and three sound bars for harmonica, violin, and cellos. And the bellows had no holes, so they didn't wheeze on every squeeze. If I could buy it... Sorry, let me repeat that. I could buy it if I could get rid of the bees in town and win the reward. I could bag the bees and solve the puzzle that had eluded all the town's wise adults from Mayor Meyer on down. The bees would be gone, and I could say I did what I did because the canoe race must go on. People would cheer, and I would take my check for 100 bucks, and with some other money I'd earned, with any luck, I'd buy that accordion. My uncle said my plan might just work. The bees he'd I bagged were big ones, might make a lot of money. Furthermore, he'd give me a buck a bag, some of the money I needed to make the extra $50. Bobby, if I had to bet, my uncle said, I'd say there's probably no more than a dozen big nests you have to get. They might be in trees, the bees will build in stone walls, under eaves, or in an old junk car. All you have to do is search town near and far with a fine tooth comb, find out where those bees have built their homes, you're going to need extra bags for that old vacuum. I have a box of them in the shed. My uncle leaned against the fence post and scratched his head. You only have six days till the race. Mayor Myers talked to the newsman and the editors agreed that what Canoe Place doesn't need is more people hearing about bees. So more than likely, people will be here on race day. The question is, will the bees chase them all away? He shook his head. The answer is no, not if you can do your job, Bobby. Now I suggest you take tomorrow, get on your bike, and find those nests. Remember, you're only looking for five or six at best. He started to walk toward the shed. Now you know there's one by Mr. Huff's, Mrs. Huff's, and she's in the hospital yet, so it won't be too tough to plug right into her patio outlet. Once you find the five you think are the biggest, get up before sunrise. Get the nozzle right by the hole where you've seen them coming and going, and when they go for their morning stroll, you bag them. Now, there might be a thousand bees in one hive, so you're going to have to keep going most of the day. Put some rocks on the nozzle or stick, stick it to the wall with tape so the nozzle doesn't fall and let the bees escape. That way, you can empty a couple of nests a day. By the weekend, the town should be okay. Uncle Carl reached into his shed of beekeeping equipment and pulled out some netting. Stick this under your hat, he said, and wear gloves and long pants. And remember that time's running out. Good luck, son. <laughs> I think this story's make-believe. I spent Sunday afternoon riding up one street and down another asking every child, father and mother, have you seen any nests, any problems with bees? I crawled under porches and climbed up in trees. By nightfall, I knew where I had to go. Eight big nests. I'd have time for only five or six, though, at best. I had a toy helmet I got in third grade, and I stuck a big bumblebee I made on it. I had some black jeans and a sweatshirt the same. On my shirt, helmet, and bike frame with big yellow letters, I taped on the bee bagger. That evening, I went down to Grandma and Grandpa's. My grandma had a long yellow extension cord she said I could borrow. She said if you want it for a week, goodness, bring it back a month from tomorrow as far as I'm concerned, 
It doesn't much matter to me. She looked tired. The only reason for having a cord that long was to plug in my vacuum. And now that that's gone, I'll never use it anyway. Grandma opened the closet where she stored the cord. Your grandfather says he'd buy us a new one tomorrow if he could afford. But we, he did fix up this little sweeper. She showed me the kind her mother used to use. It wasn't electric, so you couldn't blow a fuse. And you didn't have to plug it in. And it wasn't noisy, which was good. But then again, it didn't do a great job like the new one would. I felt badly for Grandma because she always worked hard. When I left, I found my grandpa looking at the sign on my bag, bike. Bobby, have you got in mind what I think you might? Yep, I said. You got it, Grandpa. The bees will be gone by Friday night. Grandma looked confused, and my grandpa looked proud. As I rode off, I heard Grandpa laugh out loud. That night, I set my alarm for 4.15, because from all I had read and heard and seen, these bees wouldn't fly till the sun warmed the air. When the bees left the hive, I planned to be there, and so I was. I rode to Mrs. Huff's through the cool morning fog and across her back lawn to a stone wall by a log. I found the hole I had watched the day before. It seemed a thousand bees, maybe more, were in that hive, though this morning there was no sign of them. I plugged in Grandma's long yellow extension cord and ran it from the patio outlet across the lawn to the hive. I hit the switch at ten minutes till five. I turned it back off at 5.15 because not one bee had, flown, had yet flown. The motor was tired and started to moan. I stared at the hole for a full 90 minutes. Then just when I thought there must be nothing in it, a bee poked out its nose. You must be looking for me, I suppose, I asked. The question was rhetorical. I hit the button and the bee was historical. <laughs> Then one after another, too many to be numbered, the bees peeped out of the hole. I filled five bags while half the town still slumbered. Then off on my buzzing bee cycle I flew, dropping the bees at my uncle's by 9.32. Then back on my bike I rode once again and pedaled through town at 10 after 10. The canalies were all up in Canada fishing, so again I needed, I needed not ask permission. The nest was in a drain pipe that had filled up with leaves, so I taped the nozzle up under the eaves and plugged a cord in the back box on the wall. Most of the worker bees were already out, but when they came back, I bagged several thousand or thereabout. There's another three bags back out at the farm. So far, my plan worked like a charm. Uncle Carl took the bees, paid me the money, and then said, come and have some lunch. We had peanut butter sandwiches with honey. Saltine crackers with real butter and fresh cow's milk, fresh cold milk from the cow. Now, wait a minute. Do you think the milk from a cow is cold? Do they plug in cows? Are they refrigerated? <laughs> oh. My uncle said, Bobby, tell me now, is this plan working well? Yeah, Uncle Carl. So the far, the bees are behaving. The vacuum has just enough suction. Uncle Carl, I think I'm saving the town from economic destruction. Then off I rode in the hot summer sun and was back in town at quarter past one. I got permission to use a plug outside the home of old Mrs. Sturgeon. She said, I haven't been out all summer for fear of the bees. I'm powerful allergic. I cleaned out her hive in two and a half hours. Just to make her feel safe, I vacuumed a few stray bees off her lawn and flowers. That afternoon and evening, I sucked in another six bags of bees from the Anderson's porch ceiling and the Swanson's pear trees. And Friday morning, I finished off a hive in an old junker bus. People were noticing a difference. Why doesn't the sky look blue, folks says. Doesn't your spirit feel lighter? Why doesn't the, why doesn't the sky look blue, folks said. Doesn't your spirit feel lighter? I myself knew that when I listened carefully, it did seem noticeably quieter. Quieter. No bees buzzing about, I suppose. Mayor Meyer's phone stopped ringing, and he wondered, is it possible the bees have stopped stinging? Well, nobody knows, said one commissioner. Could be, I suppose, said a selectman. Lawrence Ritter, who wrote for the 
newspaper was out in the street doing interviews, asking folks what they thought about the miracle about the exodus of bees. Folks were saying, yep, really something hard to understand. And then Ritter ran into my grandpa who said, now listen to me, young man. I know the how and I know the who. You tell Mayor Meyer now, he better do what he said he'd do. And my grandpa told the reporter the whole story. Mr. Ritter said, don't worry, I'll tell the mayor. Now, where is the boy? I was bagging my last big nest, probably twice the size of all the rest. I was hanging by my knees in one of the town square maple trees when the flash bulb started popping. I looked down to see Mr. Ritter, several other reporters, and to my amazement, Mayor Meyer himself. Son, that's ingenious, he said. Where'd you ever get an idea like that? But then I told him the whole story, just like I told you. Should we go back and read it all? <laughs> if the people come this weekend, the mayor said, and if they stay, I hereby swear, I shall declare, Bobby the Bee Bagger Day. We'll have a town-wide celebration, at which time you shall receive your just reward. The annual riverfront cele- Boy, I stuttered. The annual riverfront celebration was a great success, and yes, a few people did get stung, but no more than had ever been stung before. So the following Saturday, across the main street of town, a big banner was strung, and when numerous speeches were spoken and anthems were sung, I was presented my plaque through thunderous applause and a $100 bill. Later that night, I dug down in my drawer full of socks and dumped dollar bills on my bed from the old cigar box my grandpa had given me. With the money I earned from my uncle for bagging bees and a few dollars I had from other stuff, plus the hundred dollars I won, I figured I had just enough. Just enough for what? Do you remember? What was he going to buy? So Monday morning with my head held high, a big smile on my face and lots of money in my wallet, I walked to town where I'd look through the store window. And there it was, though there were several I'm sure. Everyone knows it was the one with the red sparkle finish that I quickly chose. The salesman said, you're buying a beauty when you buy one of these. Yes, you can never, you can even hear the quality, never a rattle, never a wheeze. I gave them the money and I said, wrap it up, please. Oh, and can you use some real pretty paper? Do you have a fancy bow? Now you might ask why you would wrap up with a fan why would you wrap it up with a fancy paper and bow? Clearly the reason is found in something you may not know. You see, I'd wanted that new accordion from the very first I'd seen her. But I didn't buy the new accordion. No, I bought a new vacuum cleaner. And when my grandparents opened the box and tears came to their eyes, my heart was so happy, even I was surprised. I learned something, to do something well and get paid for your part, that's good. And we should expect no less, but to do something simply out of the kindness of your heart when the payment is just joy. Now that's the very best. That's a good story, isn't it? Well, that's all for now. Bye-bye. Love you.